Okay, right, we're bang on two o'clock, so we'll kick off if that's okay. We're obviously glad and sad that we have to be here again because Julian uh, Assange remains incarcerated in Belmarsh Prison and today's meeting is part of an international campaign of solidarity, of protest to demand his release and an end to the extradition uh, proceedings. We're very glad that this has taken place in conjunction with a whole number of initiatives, the length and breadth of Ireland stalls, uh, public events, protests and so on, uh, but also internationally because, as we all know, Julian Assange is in prison for exposing US war crimes. So what we want to do today, I'm joined by a bunch of three wise men here, uh, they will uh, chip in soon, but what we want to do is, first of all, update people regarding where the case against Julian is now, uh, but we also want to remind people of the reality of the consequences of the war crimes that he highlighted. The devastation that was meted out in Afghanistan and in Iraq and we're absolutely delighted to have with us Pader King and Dennis Halliday who will introduce as they come along who will specialise on the impact in Afghanistan and in Iraq. But first, without further uh, ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague in the European Parliament, uh, Mick Wallace, who will deal with where we are now with the case against Julian Assange. And the proceedings are being recorded. It will be put out on social media. We hope all of our speakers, I'll make a few points about the campaign after the lads have spoken. We'll speak for about 10 minutes each or so. We'll open up to questions from the floor, ideally questions and not necessarily big speeches. And we'd hope that maybe about an hour, a little bit over an hour should be good for you know purposes on, on social media and so on. So without further ado, uh, Mick Wallace. How's it going? Uh, I suppose, given um, the manner in which the media have covered the issue um, in the last 10 years, you could be forgiven for wondering uh, what it was like when it started, uh, because there's been a serious, um, oh, a, an abuse of the truth uh, in so many areas. But anyway, I mean, just, just to go back to lay the, the setting as to where it all came from. In 2010, Assange and Wikileaks published these massive journalistic disclosures, uh, mainly about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, they were published in a number of papers around the world, uh, New York Times, The Guardian, The Spiegel, and a few others. And it was a massive event at the time, and it was perceived as being an, an, an amazing uh, piece of journalism, and there was a great reception for it. And so you had established papers like the New York Times and the Guardian uh, publishing this stuff, and yet today the same people are reluctant to actually stand by the same man who gave them this stuff that uh, gave them so much to go on in that time. Uh, but WikiLeaks and Assange revelations uh, in 2010 really had a, a sort of an impact that we hadn't, I can't think of one that would match it uh, before that. Uh, the revelations that they brought forward exposed the fact that the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were, were a lie. And the people in those countries didn't want the occupiers. And it exposed the number of people that were being killed. It exposed the amount of destruction that was taking place. It exposed the amount of torture that was going on. It blew a huge hole in the credibility of the US military industrial complex. It blew a huge hole in what NATO was all about. And it blew a hole as well in the EU support for all this madness, nonsense, destruction. So it went without saying that WikiLeaks were putting themselves up there. And I suppose the world was wondering, 
what will happen and how will it be dealt with by the powers that be. Now, the US and the Pentagon were obviously seriously embarrassed and they weren't actually going to let Assange and WikiLeaks away with it and they were going to challenge it. And Assange knew that he had good reasons to be afraid of the US. The amount of control that they have worldwide, probably the most controlling empire in the history of mankind to date. And he was rightly afraid. So in 2012, from what I remember, he sought extradition in the Ecuadorian embassy because he was working from London mostly at the time when they published the, uh, the cables. And he went into the Ecuadorian <laughs> embassy who were friendly at the time. Uh, Korea was in power in Ecuador <clears throat> and uh, he was of uh, a left wing leaning and he was supportive. And uh, now, in 2017, uh, Korea was thrown out and he was replaced by a fellow called uh, Lennon Moreno, who turned out had done deals with the Americans. And in 2019, they fucked Assange out of the embassy uh, in return for an IMF deal that Moreno was looking for for, uh, for Ecuador. Now, uh, once he was extradited, or once he was thrown out of the embassy, uh, he was obviously more vulnerable again. People will know that there was a lot of talk about uh, the charges in Sweden. Uh, he was, there was rape alleged uh, by two different ladies, and, but those charges were dropped in 2015. Assange had been prepared to face charges in Sweden, but was scared of going there. He wanted to be tried in England. He didn't want to go to Sweden because he feared that the Swedes would extradite him to the US when, where he would likely end up in prison and they'd probably throw the key away. Uh, but anyway, those charges were dropped in 2015, but it probably should be noted that the mainstream media never let up on using that charge against him as something, uh, as almost a reason for not defending him because at, at the core of all this is that Julian Assange was a journalist and everyone in Europe thinks that journalists should be protected. Everyone in Europe thinks that human rights should be protected. But unfortunately we've got pretty selective about whose human rights uh, should be protected, what journalists should be protected. Uh, for example, uh, in this week the European Parliament uh, is very concerned about the human rights of journalists in Belarus and Russia and other places, but it's not so interested in the, uh, the human rights of a journalist that's in a high security prison called Belmarsh in London, uh, called Julian Assange. So the manner in which they have been selected uh, with their concerns uh, shows a, an incredible level of hypocrisy. And while he's been in, in Belmarsh, the first court case came up. The Americans, the minute he was released, the Americans were tipped off that he's been released. Interestingly enough, the Swedes weren't. Um, and uh, the Americans moved to extradite him straight away. So Assange ended up in the Magistrates' Court in 2020. And there was a, a number of days of the court case. Uh, myself and Claire uh, attended a few of the court cases. Uh, we got into the first few, we were blocked from uh, uh, accessing uh, the others. Uh, had in a small court case, uh, you would like to think that justice is uh, carried out and trials are carried out in public view, but they've done their utmost to make sure that there was as little public uh, surveillance uh, or witness of Julian Assange's trials, court cases, uh, as possible. Uh, which exposes them in a bad way. But the first case uh, in the Magistrate Court, the judge was not friendly to Assange, was pretty unreasonable uh, right through it, was clearly Atlanticist, pro-American, 
uh, pro-UK establishment. But yet, at the end of the day, she actually picked one pint. She didn't accept the fact that he was being a persecuted journalist because she didn't want to accept the fact that he was a journalist, even though he was. But she actually did uh, accept one point from the defence, which was that Julian Assange would be a risk of suicide if brought to the US, because the conditions in US prisons <coughs> are so bad. Now, for a right-wing judge in London who almost had uh, what looked like uh, her mind made up before the court case even started in London. For her to actually not refuse to extradite Assange to America on the basis that the US prisons were so bad will tell you something about the US prisons. Now, people probably know that 25% of the prisoners in the world are in prison in America. People probably know that the private sector run the prisons in America. People probably know that there's probably more lobbyists for the prison industry uh, in Washington looking for uh, extra conditions so that the, the, the prison population continues to grow because it's a huge money-making operation. Uh, so even that judge felt that throwing Assange over to the Americans where he could end up in one of these prisons was too bad. Uh, was really interesting. And obviously, when the case comes up uh, next week, which myself and Clay are going to, uh, that will be challenged. The, the, the psychologists who argued that he would be a suicide risk if, if put in a prison in America, uh, you'll find that the US uh, crowd will target him and try and undermine him uh, in the, in the, on next Wednesday and Thursday. But listen, Obviously, we don't know what's, what's going to happen, but uh, that's what's expected, right? But uh, the judge wouldn't accept any of the press freedom arguments in the case, and uh, she didn't accept that this, the US uh, indictment charges were politically motivated. Um, but at the same time, it was, uh, for me anyway, uh, I was surprised that she actually took the position that uh, the things were so bad in America that she couldn't send them down. So listen, in, since then, uh, Assange has spent another, uh, about a, over a year in Belmarsh in solitary confinement, a high security prison, as if he had quilt, killed uh, 10 people with his bare hands in his time. I mean, can you think about it? I mean. The idea that he would be in solitary confinement in a high security prison, uh, and he was a journalist, who had, there was absolutely no evidence that he was a risk, a physical risk, a violent risk to anybody on the planet in, in all his lifetime. And yet, he's in a solitary confinement in Belmarsh, one of the highest security prisons in Britain. And the media have been so silent. It's shocking. And it exposes where the mainstream media has, has found itself today. And unfortunately, they've become a huge part of the problem and are not part of the solution. But evidence have come to light in that last year where Assange has been waiting for this next uh, the appeal trial on, on the part of Americans, because the Americans have appealed the decision of the UK courts not to extradite him. One of the things that come to light is that uh, the Spanish uh, firm that were hired by the Ecuadorian embassy uh, to do security work in the embassy were actually working for the CIA as well. And they were uh, recording all his legal meetings, it's 100% it's illegal under international law. It violates his legal rights. So, the, can you think about it? The legal meetings that he was having in private <coughs> in the Ecuadorian embassy were being recorded and sent to America. And no one, how many papers did you see 
get out of it. <coughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. Now, on top of that, there's uh, last summer, uh, a key witness in the US case against Assange uh, has turned out to be a con man, a fellow called uh, Siji from Iceland. And he admitted to the press that what he told the FBI was a bunch of lies because he said that the, the, he was being paid to be an informant. And the US case against Assange is based on those lies. So that's another aspect to it, right? And um, I mean, you wouldn't need a whole lot more evidence, but only lately we found out that Mike Pompeo, who was head of the CIA at the time under Trump's administration, and listen, Trump isn't the only one that's been after Assange. It started with Obama, continued with Trump, and it's continuing with Biden. But it's turned out that they actually considered kidnapping him, and they considered assassinating him. Did it make the front page of the Irish Times? I don't think so. Now, I wouldn't buy the right mag anymore, <laughs> so I'm not sure, but maybe you know, right? But, uh, I mean, isn't it? Could you just think about it, right? They even considered and were open to the idea they were talking about how they would kill him, right? Now, obviously, if they had him in a US prison like Epstein, they would just poison him and it'd be grand. But because he was in London, they were actually, they were actually prepared to have a gunfight outside the embassy. But this was all going on when he was still in the Ecuadorian embassy. Can you just imagine it? This, this, they were going to try and, and, and assassinate him in Britain, on the streets. Whatever happened to international law? And whatever happened to the people that used to try and hold people to account, called the media? Whatever happened to them? What's going on? Where are they gone? Look at um, this is a landmark case that we haven't seen the likes of before. And I think people need to appreciate the fact that this is a, a really crucial case. And Assange has to win. He's 100% truth on his side. If there's any justice, he will win. If he loses and he ends up in a US prison, he's already spent 10 years locked up, whether it was in the embassy or in the Belmar sense. He's already spent 10 years deteriorating and he's not in good health. They've tried to slowly kill him up to now. They had looked at killing him quickly on them with Pompeo's ideas. But they're still, when he got, when he even that right wing judge refused to extradite him <coughs> in 2020, she refused to allow him to be free while he was waiting for the American appeal. Why? How often does that happen? Who was he arrested? They're torturing him in prison. They've been torturing him for 10 years. And they're continuing to torture him. And they won't be happy until he's dead. But the only people that stop him, it won't be the media, it's people like yourselves. The people have to have their voice heard. You've got to put more pressure on anyone that you know that can make any kind of form of an influence because what we know that we can't depend totally on the courts to come up with the right answer. But the politicians are always vulnerable and we cannot give up on this case. Thank you.
Okay, thanks very much, Mick. Mick obviously went a little bit over his time, but anybody who knows him knows he's totally lawless and it would be completely <laughs> pointless of me to try and stop him. But look, he did summarise very well uh, the legal situation where we are with this case and what is at stake for Julian Assange is the fact that he may be sent to the United States to carry out a sentence of potentially 175 years to a country which the evidence has shown reve and revealed attempted to kidnap uh, and kill him. So this is a very sick man, it's very worrying and all of that information that Mick highlighted about the fake witness, about the plot to kill him, about the surveillance in the embassy, none of this can be considered by the courts in the UK next week. The only thing that they will be looking at is, is he a suicide risk or is he not? Is it safe to incarcerate him in America or is it not? So it's incredibly limited, which is why it's very important that we're here because the political campaign is going to have to step in. And to that end and to fortify that campaign, we have to remind ourselves of what is the crime that Julian faces and is in this situation for. And it's for revealing US war crimes, particularly in Afghanistan and in Iraq. That's the indictment, it's about nothing else. So we've asked Padder and Dennis to deal with this because where next speaker up is Padder King. Padder would be potentially known to some of you for his excellent documentary making um, on Irish state affiliated media sometimes, RTE, uh, what in the world. Um, but Padder has been to Afghanistan and seen the consequences of the US interventionism there and Padre's going to talk about that and we're delighted to have him here. Uh, thanks very much Claire for that uh, warm introduction. Thanks to Mick as well for kind of taking us through those kind of critical issues and, and, and the context uh, for uh, and, and the rationale for our being here and thanks very much to you for coming here as well today uh, in support of Julian Assange. Um, I'm going to begin by hazarding a guess that, uh, that everyone here has experienced grief. Uh, I have too, but not until uh, late in my life, Th three years ago to be precise. And in thinking about grief, I think there is grief and there is inexplicable grief. Both my uh, parents died uh, uh, well into their old age. Uh, my father was 93 when he died. Uh, the morning of his death, he had just fed 14 calves, came in, had a cup of tea, and he sat down and died. Um, it was, I think, an appropriate death. Although, you know, given the option, um, I think he would have welcomed additional years. Um, most farmers like to see their calves grow into adulthood, even if it is in readiness for the slaughterhouse. Um, my mother, on the other hand, had a longer goodbye on the cusp of 92 years of age. After a long period of dementia, she too passed away. Hers was also an appropriate death. It is part of the human condition. The fact is, we die. Then, three years ago, another death. And this was an altogether different death that shook me to the core, a death from which there was no shelter. To borrow from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, he who was living is now dead. We who are living are now dying. His was not an appropriate death. And then more death, this time in Afghanistan, on the evening of the 6th of May, 2012. On that evening, a US airstrike controller watching a screen in a room far away from the action told two pilots patrolling over Afghanistan's Pakta province close to Pakistan to bomb and straff a farmhouse thought to contain Taliban militants. The pilots studied the area and refused the order. They could see that the house was a civilian target. Then another voice came over the radio network, the crew of the B-1 bomber circling overhead, was running low on fuel and 
having failed to drop any bombs in recent missions, was eager to go kinetic. Its flurry of bombs flattened the farmhouse of the Shafi'ullah family, killing the mother, the father, and five of their seven children, the youngest only 10 months old. No armed men were present in the farmhouse. The death of the Shafiula family was not appropriate. And that above report, by the way, is just taken from the recently published book by Andrew Coburn, The Spoils of, of War. We have in Afghanistan since the current war's inception, sorry, what we have in Afghanistan since the current war's inception is a deliberate mass government sponsored killing. And the chief responsibility for this mass slaughter rests with the United States government. The only government in the world, according to Noam Chomsky, that has been at war, almost always aggressive war, from the first moment of its founding. The United States and its client states, Britain, Australia, the Netherlands, Canada, France, the list goes on. Chomsky argues that if the Nuremberg principles, crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, if they applied to every post-World War II president, then every post-World War II president would be hanged. <laughs> not that I support hanging, far from it. Hanging is not an appropriate death. And we have seen too much inappropriate death in the world as it is. Included among those US president in the violation of the Nuremberg principles is Barack Obama. In 2017, the United States military relaxed its rules of engagement for airstrikes in Afghanistan, which resulted in a massive increase in civilian casualties. From the last year of the Obama administration to the last full year of recorded data during the Trump administration, the number of civilians killed by US-led airstrikes in Afghanistan increased by 330%. Aerial bombardment is nothing new for the beleaguered people who live under Afghan skies. According to Margaret Macmillan in her book, War, How Conflict Has Shaped Us, the British used bombers in Iraq and Afghanistan as far back as the early 1920s. And in 2016, I witnessed firsthand the devastation wrought by, earlier, by air, aerial bombardment. <coughs> A year earlier, midnight, the 7th of August 2015, the home of Basiria Sultani. And from her, I quote, when the bomb exploded, I was asleep in the bedroom with my husband and baby. I was pregnant at the time. When the bomb exploded, I didn't hear its voice or sound. I was deaf and blinded by its impact. The power had gone. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't find anything. The room was dark. I was trying to find my phone to turn its light, to find where my husband was. When I woke up, I saw everything was destroyed. There was smoke everywhere. My leg hurt. Everywhere was blood on my body. I didn't know where my husband was. I didn't know where my son was either. There was blood on me from head to toe. My room was on the second floor. When I came down to the first floor, I saw all the walls had collapsed. I noticed my mother-in-law had my son in her arms. She was also bloody. That night I went to the hospital. When I woke up, I noticed all my body was injured. I didn't know my husband had died. I didn't know my brother-in-law had died. End of quote. In a breach of custom, Basira showed me her injuries. Her leg darkened with bruises. The muscles seemed to have collapsed inwards and stitches ran along each side of her leg. My whole body is like this, she said. My neck, my head, also my ear, all over my body. At the time, she was just 22 years of age. 
In all, she had eight operations and still glass remained lodged in her body. Her body is broken. She has difficulty walking, difficulty sitting, difficulty sleeping. Pain racks her body. Her husband is dead. Dead too, her brother-in-law, Abdullah. The death of Basira's husband, Masood, and her brother-in-law, Abdullah, were not appropriate. And then, on the 29th of August this year, in what is the last known missile fired by the United States in its 20-year war in Afghanistan, 10 innocent civilians, including seven children, were killed. The military called it a righteous strike. Among those killed was Zamiri Ahmadi, an electrical engineer who once worked for a US NGO. What I'm going to read for you now is an extract from a report written by the New York Times journalist uh, Matthew Atkins on the 2nd of October uh, of this year. And I quote, at around 4.50, as Mr. Ahmadi pulled into his courtyard, several of his children and his brother's children came out, excited to see him, and sat in the car as he backed it inside. Mr. Ahmadi's brother, Romal, was sitting on the ground floor with his wife when he heard the sound of the gate opening and Mr. Ahmadi's car entering. His adult cousin, Nasser, had gone to fetch water for his ablutions and greeted him. The car's engine was still running when there was a sudden blast. The US military had launched a Hellfire missile. Ramel ran out into the courtyard and he saw that his nephew Philo, age 16, had fallen from the exterior staircase. His torso and head grievously wounded by shrapnel. He wasn't breathing. Amid the smoke and fire, he saw another dead nephew before neighbours arrived and pulled him away. End of quote. Mr. Ahmadi and three of his children, Zamir, age 20, Faisal, age 16, and Farzad, age 10, were all killed in the blast. So too were Mr. Ahmadi's cousin, Nasser, age 30. Three of Rommel's children, Arwen, age seven, Benjamin, age six, Hyatt, age two, and two three-year-old girls, Malika and Samaya, were also killed. To paraphrase T.S. Eliot, they who were living are now dead. They who are living are now dying. There was nothing appropriate about the deaths of these people. Mr. Sorry, the grief of Mr. Rahmadi's family and extended family is no different from the grief of Bazira Sultana's, Sultani's family and extended family, is no different to the grief of the Shafula family and extended family, is no different to the grief experienced by the families killed by the British back in 1920. But while their grief and our grief in terms of intensity of feeling, that sense of loss, is similar, in one fundamental way, our grief is different. Theirs was a deliberate, willful, state-sponsored killing. A far distant country destroys your family. And what must it be like to hear that government say, we're doing it in your interest? Killings sanctioned by the government of the United States of America and client states, Britain most noticeably, but European <coughs> countries too. And for all of those Western political leaders who now, claim, who now loudly proclaim their concern for the well-being of the women of children of Afghanistan under the Taliban, where was your concern before the Taliban took back control? Where was your empathy? Where was your shared humanity? Where Ursula von der Leyen? Where Boris Johnson? Where Joe Biden? Where Michal Martin? And for all of those who will take this as an apology for the Taliban, it is not. I refuse to take that bait. 
I refuse to engage <coughs> excuse me, in that zero-sum game. And I think I speak for all of us on this platform when I say we are not Taliban apologists. But equally, we will not be silenced in our critique of what Western imperialism, led by imperialists writ large, the United States of America, have done to the people of Afghanistan. And we all owe a gratitude to all of those journalists, all the activists, all the whistleblowers, those extraordinary, brave and courageous people who have opened our eyes to the grief and trauma of the war-weary people of Afghanistan. In the hope, perhaps even in the vain hope, that we in the West will come to our senses and end the killing. Thanks very much. Very much, Pater. Uh, powerful, uh, shocking, uh, having a deep impact. And of course, these are the crimes that were exposed by WikiLeaks and by Julian Assange. They were the people who exposed the sham that the US and NATO were involved in Afghanistan and Iraq for democracy, for human rights. What an utter insult. And can you imagine if this case against Julian was taken? 10 years ago, it will be completely different. There will be thousands of people out on the streets demanding his release, but of course 10 years have intervened. But the suffering for the people in the regions of Afghanistan and Iraq should not be forgotten. And we're very honoured to have with us Dennis Halliday. Dennis, of course, needs no introduction. He was one of the uh, Iraqi uh, weapons inspectors, UN veteran, peace campaigner, anti-war uh, activist who will give us the, um, I suppose, the outlook from the perspective of Iraq where he has much experience. Thanks very much. Ken. Yeah, usually at this stage I ask with the CIA man present, please stand up. Actually, I was never a weapons inspector, it's slightly incorrect. I was head of the United Nations humanitarian program, which was designed to counter the sanctions, those lovely sanctions imposed by the Americans and the British and others on the people of Iraq. Well, Julian Assange has taught me, and many others, that the terrorists do not lurk, do not live in Iraq, do not live in Afghanistan, no, nor, nor, nor in that part of the world. The terrorists live in Washington and London and on the Security Council of the United Nations with their mercenaries, their huge and disgusting choice of weapons, plus the desire to control and own others. They create terror in the places and timing of their choosing, to quote Mr. Bush when he remember the 9-11 speech. That, that, that suits their plans, their cruelty, their terrorism. That's where the terrorists reside. Today, I must say, I'm honored to speak a few words here as we try to find ways to support Julian Assange. And I, try and, I find it very hard to imagine the sort of mental and physical pain he must have been in for these 10 years, but particularly in solitary confinement, in the hellhole that is Belmarsh Prison in London. That is really a nightmare in itself. I once spent two days in an Israeli prison. That was enough for me. Now every morning I go through the uh, Sky, BBC, CNN, France 24, TRT, Al Jazeera, I'm a bit of a junkie and unemployed, of course, so I have time for that sort of stuff. And, and throughout those programs, and some of you are not going to be happy with what I'm going to say, I find the mark of Julian Assange. There's more courage, there's more truth. Journalists are less afraid to speak out. They give their views, and sometimes they're quick about it, which is a great improvement. For example, when the hunt them down Biden killed the family that uh, Pat had just mentioned, it took the Pentagon something like a week or seven or eight days to admit what they had done. CNN knew about it in two days. And if you're interested, on my phone here, I have the photographs of all of those children 
that Pat mentioned, which we can put on the table if you so wish. Kathy Kelly sent me those. Some of you may remember Kathy Kelly. She's a very well-known activist. She sent me those photographs uh, recently. And to hunt them down, the Biden language, to me that is the language of terrorism. That's, that's terrorist speak, I would call it. The Afghan family, they were the victims, the innocent victims of American military and careless aggression. Now, Julian Assange has exposed, along with Chelsea Manning, the war crimes committed in Iraq, or many of them, or some of them. The torture in Abu Ghraib, I'm sure you all remember those photographs, of uh, female uh, American troops threatening naked uh, Iraqi men with dogs, large alsatians. Other people had their genitals attached to electric uh, power. I mean, the brutality was something to behold, completely disgusting and in violation of everything that we all hold true. Meantime, the British, of course, after the, uh, had control of Basra, and they committed equally horrible crimes in Basra, killing innocent uh, civilians, torturing, the usual stuff. And these often were SAS people who learned their <coughs> trade, apparently, or maybe honed their trade in the north of Ireland. And Pauling, inhumanity, shown to Iraqi victims, in their own homes, in their own country, it's disgusting. Now, a friend of mine called Muslim Beg runs uh, an NGO called CAGE, C-A-G-E. It's a charity to assist those who were shipped out of Afghanistan and Iraq into Guantanamo Bay. Because after Guantanamo Bay is on your resume, it's hard to get a job. And that's what he's doing, is trying to place these people who suffered in Guantanamo Bay. He himself was there for seven years without charge. Sheikh Hamad is now there, I think, for 15 years without charge. I mean, it's, it's an obscenity. Uh, it's been an example of what is American injustice, what it looks like. And it shows how dangerous. I mean, the prisons, as we've heard uh, from Mick, are, are horrible. 2.3 million uh, people uh, inhabit the prisons of the United States. The problem is not, not the quality of the food. The problem is they're privately owned. And if you're a private prison owner, the last thing you want to see is people being released and going home. It just makes common sense. So one, no wonder they have the largest uh, population proportionally in any country in the, in the world. Now, uh, Mozambique, uh, as I said, uh, spent seven years in Guantanamo Bay and was tortured. Now, that's, that is terrorism. That's terrorist maltreatment. And just recently, Nick Robertson, uh, went, took CNN cameras through Bagram Air Base, which uh, of course is um, Afghanistan, showing the way the Americans held and tortured thousands of uh, Afghans in their own country, in their own space of Bagram Air Base, which is a, it's the size of a small town. They also were shipped by aircraft, some of which landed in Shannon Airport. And I just happened to be sitting on that book about Shannon Airport to remind me that we facilitated these people going through shackled, spread eagles on, on, on military aircraft on the way to Guantanamo Bay. No facilities, no toilets. You can imagine what it's like being uh, 16, 18 hours in that condition with no facilities. Now, I, I see, as I said, in Julian Assange, I can see changes. We've just had two journalists recognized by a somewhat disruptive outfit called the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> characters. Uh, and, but that is something that says a lot that these two people have the courage and, and survived <coughs> with that courage and spoke up and were rewarded. But of course, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Henry Kissinger, so that does tarnish the damn thing, I must say, uh, in my mind. It was Ambassador, UN Ambassador, US Ambassador Albright, uh, who was sitting at the governing of the Security Council, but went on NBC 60 Minutes, a well known program in New York, which you may be familiar with. And we were, they were talking about sanctions, the sanctions that I was there to counter through a massive, uh, uh, a massive uh, program of $4.2 billion a year, financed, let me add, quickly, entirely by the sale of Iraqi oil. There was no charity involved here. Uh, and Albright announced that, yes, it's true, 500,000 500, Iraqi children had died uh, from malnutrition, through neglect, through poverty, 
to the lack of power and the lack of clean water due to the UN, UN sanctions imposed on the country by the Security Council, the same Security Council that I deem is controlled by terrorists. And that, by that I mean the five veto powers, the United States, Britain, the Russians, the Chinese, and the French. They are the veto powers. They are the terrorists who sit on the, on the Security Council and make the decisions that lead to sanctions, or turn the back when it comes to invading Iraq, or, 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 don't, or, or, or don't stand up and be counted when it comes to the destruction of, of Afghanistan or Syria and other places. It's something we have to think about. Again, saying that 500 children, the death of 500 children is, is, is worth it, as she said, that's terrorist speak. In, my, in the way I see things. Now, it's no surprise that people like Bush, and his dad, for that matter, and Blair, and now Boris, and now Biden, fear Julian Assange. Of course they do. He exposes their lies, their, their, their stories of fiction, and their cruelty, and their ability, as they pray in church on Sunday morning, as they send troops to kill on Monday morning. I don't understand these people. This is just obscene in the, way I, in the way I see things. And we've learned, as, as we just heard, I think, from Mick, from the CIA, who was, is planning, or had, may well still be planning, but certainly was planning, to murder Julian Assange, which shows you there's no level below which these people will sink in following American uh, policy. And the same goes, I think, for Boris, who is no better off, no, no, no higher ilk. It's not surprising, then, that when we see the victims uh, fighting back. Westminster is the home of the British government. The British government runs MOD, the Ministry of Defense. They're the ones who participate in depleted uranium. They're the ones who use torture, whether it's the north of Ireland or it's in Basra or it's in other parts of Afghanistan. The, they are the enemy. They are the terrorists. Westminster is housing at terrorists. So those who feel bitter and angry and have seen their own countries and their faith maybe plus their country damaged, destroyed by these people, fight back. They are the victims fighting back, and I think we have to accept that. But we have, a, we, it's, it's late in the day, uh, and but there's an opportunity yet. Despite the, what I say about the terrorists sitting around the Security Council, there are still some good guys there. And hopefully one of them <laughs> is Ireland. We are a member now of the Security Council for two years. We have a seat on the Security Council. We're a cheek to jowl with the Americans, the French, and the rest. We have a chance to stand up and do something about Julian Assange in a very public way, if we have the guts and we have the courage to do so. Now, whether Simon Coveney has that sort of courage, or has the authority, or would get the support of the Oireachtas, of the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, I'm not sure. But damn it, we stand for a lot of good things in this country. Our peacekeeping is out, uh, outstanding in its quality overseas. And it goes back to the Congo in the 1950s. I would hope that Ireland would have the courage to stand up, if not tomorrow, the day after, in the Security Council and raise this issue of Assange. No matter what happens in the court case next week, we should stand up and take a position and embarrass and humiliate the British and the Americans if necessary. To find some way to block his transportation to the United States, where they will certainly, if they don't kill him quickly, they'll certainly kill him over the long haul. I think they're promising him 175 days. Outrageous. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dennis. And uh, of course, Ireland hasn't played that role as of yet in terms of calling for Julian's release and stressing the importance of this case. But that, to be honest, is one of the reasons for today's meeting, to play our part in the international campaign that is actually growing to demand an end to his persecution. And I'm sorry to Dennis for calling him a weapons inspector. It was a, a compliment in many ways because I've seen him in the context of the other whistleblowers who shed light on the true consequences of the war crimes of US imperialism. And these are the truth tellers who expose the real consequences of war and war crimes full on. But look, in wrapping up this part of the meeting, I just want to make a few points. And I think it should be obvious at this stage that we cannot rely 
on justice in the courts to deliver uh, Julian at this stage. We can't just sit back. We will go to the court case, of course, on Wednesday and Thursday. But really, actually, what's posed in front of us is a political battle. He won't be rescued by legal niceties, but by a political struggle. And I think in that, all of us can play a part uh, rather than sitting around and, and waiting for the courts. Ultimately, the way in which Julian will be freed or not is whether Joe Biden decides to drop the case. And he will only do that under pressure because Mick is right, this case comes from Obama, Trump, Biden and so on. They have the gift to sort this by the writing of a pen or whatever, but we need to put them under pressure to do that. And Irish civil society and the political establishment can help in that. And I think Dennis is quite right. Uniquely, Ireland has a role on the international stage. We're on the Security Council now, but we have a reputation of being honest brokers, even though we traditionally have obviously bent the knee to US imperialism, but we are accepted in terms of our a peacekeeping role and so on. So I do think the campaign in Ireland can be very important. We need civil society groups taking this up. We're glad to see a whole number of the political parties in the Dáil now taking it up. But one of the things I suppose I want to stress in summing up this part of the meeting is to say that how do we win people over to Julian's cause? And one of the things we need to do that is counter the disinformation and, and prejudice that have surrounded his case because for 10 years his reputation has been targeted by disinformation by US uh, establishment and so on. So I think we need to be clear on some of those facts and leave this meeting emboldened to go out and demand justice and freedom for him. And there's three points really that we want to stress. The first one that we need to make time and again is that Julian Assange is a journalist. Now in some ways, and I know Dennis was kind of saying we shouldn't be, but in some ways for us that's a bit of an insult because there aren't too many good journalists out there anymore. But Julian Assange is certainly one of them. And the reason why it's important to say that he's a journalist is that journalists are entitled to protection under international law to protect their sources, Freedom of the press is a, an ideology or a, a belief that people in the European Union say is sacred. We have to defend freedom of the press and so on. Well, let them put their money where their mouth is because Julian Assange is a journalist. He's a member of the MEAA, that's the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, Australia's Union for Journalists recognised as a member by that organisation and by all international journalistic uh, organisations who have confirmed his status as a journalist. The most prestigious civil society organisations in the world have also backed that. Uh, Reporters Without Borders, American Civil Liberties Union, the Committee to Protect Journalists, Freedom of the Press Foundation, the Index of Censorship, all of these organisations have unanimously condemned the indictment against Assange. They've said the things he's charged for are journalism and they're protected under law, under the press freedoms in the United States and worldwide. And they've called on Biden then to drop the charges. And again, as we say, in the EU, these things we're told are really important. But as Mick says, in this week, the week before Julian's appeal, who does the European Union give the freedom of thought in uh, award to? Not Julian Assange, but Alexei Navalny. Now, seriously, you couldn't actually make it up. But that is an important point of the campaign. Another important point and the key thing we want to make really is that he has been persecuted for journalism because there is confusion about what he's charged for and there's been a concerted effort to sort of blur the lines on this. That it's something to do with Russiagate, with the fact that Hillary Clinton lost the election to Trump or any, or any of this nonsense or somehow that it's about hacking that it's not about journalism. It's not about any of these things at all. If you want to know what Julian Assange is being pursued for, read the US indictment. It's a public document, it's publicly available. He is being charged on 18 counts. There's nothing in it about Russia, there's nothing in it about anything else. All of it relates to the journalism that he carried out in 2010, exposing the wars in Afghanistan and the wars in Iraq full stop. Publications which, as Mick said, were celebrated as groundbreaking journalism in 2010. 
publications that he got awards for. He ha his work has enabled thousands of victims to get justice for the crimes that were carried out against them. He exposed NATO propaganda and so on. All of this is on the public record and it's there in black and white in the indictment. So the US government is basically saying in this case that it's criminal for Julian Assange to receive confidential information from a US military source. That's what journalists do. They say it's criminal for him to have held on to that material, as any journalist would, and they say it's criminal for him to have published it, which is actually how journalism is supposed to happen. It's supposed to be about holding power to account in the public interest. This is demonstrably in the public interest. He didn't gain anything by it. The victims gained by his stance. This is open and shut. These are journalistic activities protected by the US First Amendment and by press freedoms internationally. And you won't find a single authority otherwise uh, to tell you that. So okay, Assange you. is not... Can I just add to that? Sure. Well, there's a precedent. You, you remember a man called Daniel Ellsberg. Yeah. He, st he stole, let's say, the so-called Pentagon Papers. When those papers were published by the New York Times and the Washington Post, he walked free. He was never charged. So there's a perfect example exactly. of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it, it's scary when you see the scale of what's gone on here. The silence of the establishment and the so-called press. So while we have, you know, the, all of the trade unions and the journalist trade unions and bodies support Assange, but do they really? What have they really done to champion his case, which is why our meeting is so important. So look, at, I mean, Assange is not a US government employee. He's not even a US citizen. You all know he's Australian. The work he did was journalism done in the UK, which at that time was in the European Union. Uh, so there's no obligation on him at all to keep US secrets or to cover up uh, US war crimes. So these are the key arguments that we want to register today in this week before his appeal is heard before the courts in London. This is about punishing someone who more than anyone in our generation held power to account. It is the press freedom case of our generation and while it's appalling that we have to be here, we are privileged actually that we've been the beneficiary of the information that Julian exposed and we've been able to add to our knowledge and our campaigning work. So we owe him. There is a strong anti-war movement in Ireland. We are complicit in these crimes by the use of Shannon Airport as part of this. So we want people to go from this meeting, emboldened to champion his cause, to get on to your politicians, to raise this case in the days and weeks to come because sadly, when this case is over, if he loses, there'll be efforts to bring him to the United States. If he wins, there'll probably be more appeals. And as the lads have said, one way or another, this system is set up in a manner in which he is going to be confined to those appalling conditions in Belmarsh to continue while that legal process untangles its way while his health continues to deteriorate and so on. So we owe him. And in breaking and before I call people in, we do have as part of the campaign before people go, we'd like you to take, there are tote bags there, take as many as you like, we'll consider it as an insult if we're left with any, which has Julian's phrase on it, which was so poignant, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by the truth which is really what this meeting is about. So people should take them, wear them with pride. There are posters there, Ju journalism is not a crime. There are stickers outside which you can take and put up on the poles as you, you know, walk home or public toilets or wherever. Get that word out, time is of the essence. And if people want to take, there is the book that myself and Mick brought out about our court case in Shannon when we um, put the US military on trial when we were brought to court for breaking into Shannon Airport. Uh, the book of that court proceedings is there, but a huge, a third of that book deals with the WikiLeaks cables in relation to Ireland and our visit to see Julian when he was in the embassy only one year at that time in 2013, 
who would have thought that almost 10 years down the road he would still be incarcerated but again that's featured in the book and we do have well i think you have to pay for the book but uh, eugene can <laughs> deal with that from but the jackets there we have jackets as well which are free people can take that too but uh, i'm going to wrap it up for this stage of the meeting but and we're a little bit over